This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 37. In this episode, I will tell the story of a Civil War veteran, Old Soldier Barnes, who became a popular ultra runner and ran in numerous six-day races in the early 1900s. You're going to learn fascinating details of these six-day races held indoors on small tracks about 120 years ago. The objective was to run as far as you could in six days. In celebration, I decided to hold a six-day race in my basement. My track is ultra-tiny, 100 feet. The runners started several hours ago and are running 52 loops to the mile. One of these runners is my good friend Craig Lloyd of trail and ultra-running fame. Craig, how can you run these dizzy loops for miles? If you can get to the point where you feel like you can run three miles without dying, you'll begin to enjoy it. Well, be careful. You look a bit dizzy. 120 years ago, spectators of six-day races came hoping to watch the runners go insane or collapse. Oops, looks like Craig may already be out. Why does every story start with Davy Crockett? Yes, a lot of people ask that when they go crazy. You know, they can improve the whole show if they just change the ending. How? Put it closer to the beginning. (laughs) And now a word from our sponsors. Ladies, tired of drying your hair with the same old vacuum cleaner? Try Avanchet brand new Beauty Locks portable hair dryer. It's smaller, it's faster, it's guaranteed to give you the hair you've always wanted in half the time. With a speedy motor that will dry your hair in as little as 25 minutes, don't worry about the little ones or that pie in the oven. Thanks to an extra long extension cord, you can move around while primping your locks. We now return to your regular programming. Now for the story of Old Soldier Barnes and the Six Day Race. Old Soldier Barnes was a Civil War veteran from Pennsylvania who became a very popular professional ultra runner in his early 50s. He must have not worn his age well, because people always thought he was much older than he really was. He entered the sport when the six-day race was making a comeback in Pennsylvania, about 20 years since its heyday in the 1800s when it was a huge spectator sport. Huge crowds would watch walkers and runners go in circles for six days trying to travel as many miles as possible. There was a brief resurgence of six-day go-as-you-please races in America from 1898 to 1903 until states passed laws to halt these all-day and all-night running affairs along with some similar six-day bicycle races. This episode will follow Barnes' participation in the sport and hopefully leave readers with a deep understanding of the fascinating six-day running races that were held about 120 years ago. Stephen Gilbert Barnes was born on May 23, 1846 in Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania. He lived in that area near Pittsburgh his entire life and went by Gilbert during his running years. During the Civil War, Barnes joined Company K of the Pennsylvania Cavalry and fought with them throughout the war. After the war in 1868, Barnes married Margaret Elizabeth Couch and they had six children. By 1874, he was a dry goods merchant in Springdale, Pennsylvania, but incurred huge debts and filed for bankruptcy and lost his store in 1880. That year, he became an editor of a newspaper. Barnes was always proud of his military service and was a member of the GAR, Grand Army of the Republic, in post-157. The GAR was a fraternal organization composed of veterans of the Union Army, Navy, and Marines who served in the Civil War. By 1898, Barnes became a professional runner and he worked very hard to be able to finish high enough to win monetary awards. Back in the 1870s, fixed-time multi-day races, especially the six-day race, had become well-established. Those who competed in them were called pedestrians. 
These races at first observed strict heel-toe walking rules, but eventually progressed into go-as-you-please formats open to both walkers and runners. Barnes became mostly a runner. At the age of 51, in April 1898, Barnes made his public professional running debut at a 72-hour six-day race held at the world's Moosey Theater in Pittsburgh. For this race, the 17 competitors would run or walk for 12 hours each day for six days on a tiny 20-lap to a mile track from noon to midnight. Many of the best American ultra runners of the time competed. The newspaper reported, The professional pedestrians entered the ring at noon and got away promptly upon the sounding of the gong. Old Soldier Barnes was loudly applauded. The pace was so hot that he had to remove his uniform before many laps were covered. The uniform, however, served to arouse the spectators to a high pitch of patriotic fever, and there were many cheers for the gallant soldier. Barnes finished his professional debut in second place with a very impressive 334 miles, less than two miles behind the winner, John Glick. In 1899, a unique race was held at Madison Square Garden in New York City. This was the first multi-day race to be held under a new state law that prohibited races for being held for more than 12 hours during a given day. They set up this race to be a 72-hour, six-day race with two waves, one starting at noon, the other starting at midnight, with a total of 31 runners. It was announced, Everything is in readiness for the beginning of the race, the sawdust track being made and laid in accordance with the wishes of the pedestrians, which always have to be respected in this matter. Much depends upon the formation of the track and its construction, whether the contestants are able to stand the strain of a long, weary jaunt. From the start, it could be seen that New York City spectators just weren't responding to the return of indoor ultra-running. At the start, there were only 200 spectators. Barnes started in the second wave. As he was finishing up his first 12 hours, the manager of Madison Square Garden came in for daily rent, and the runners noticed that something was wrong. After raising only $143 in gate receipts, the race manager could not be found anywhere. Fearing that they would be doing this huge effort without hope of prize money, most of the runners stopped. Only four continued, including Barnes, who claimed he was doing it for health, not money. But as the crowd started to dwindle away, the garden management turned out the lights and drove away the rest of the runners at midnight. Barnes reached 67 miles. Some in the press were delighted with the race failure. <laughs> As for these ghastly shows known as six-day races, one can only be thankful that they will soon run their course. However strong a man may be, there is neither rhyme nor reason in taxing his powers to this extent. In 1900, Barnes took part in his first six-day go-as-you-please race held in St. Louis, Missouri. Sixteen runners started. Barnes reached 109 miles in the first day. On day two, it was reported, the bunch has thinned down to ten men, and those who remained had steadied down to a slow, plodding gait, with only a spurt now and then when the band started to play, while the men who are still in the race have not been going long enough to cause them to be cranky. The strain is beginning to tell. Most of them had left off much of the clothing they had on at the start, and are racing in undershirt, tights, and old shoes or stockings. Barnes amuses the crowds by occasionally walking backwards and doing jig steps. After 48 hours, Barnes reached 196 miles, just two miles behind the leaders. On day four, Barnes took the lead with 327 miles and was setting a killing pace looking to be the winner, but eventually lost the lead on day five to Thomas Cox. Old man Barnes took a great rest this morning, as did Cox, the new leader. These two contestants are watching each other like hawks, each determined not to let the other get the advantage. In the end, Barnes finished with an amazing 539 miles in third place. It was his lifetime six-day best. Cox reached 545 miles. 
The city of Philadelphia successfully revived the six-day race in 1901. Barnes competed at Industrial Art Hall on a 17-lap to a mile track. It started with 24 runners at 12.30 a.m. in front of a large crowd. The pace was fast at the start, but after 21 hours, it was slow. Gilbert Barnes, pale face and bent shoulders, carried the weight of 60-odd years, actually 55, is a man who attracts attention. He is an old soldier and started out bedecked with badges. These he has laid aside as well as his army coat and is down to solid business. As the event progressed, it was reported that the race will prove a big success is hardly doubted now, as all day yesterday and last night the big hall was crowded and the police had their hands full keeping the aisles clear. At 10 o'clock there were over 3,000 people in the place and their presence seemed to inspire new life into the already weary walkers and the cheers and encouraging words of the spectators and the music of the band kept more than one of them from giving up in despair. On the second day, it was said that Barnes appeared to look the worst off. One or two of the men have shown signs of going daffy for a time. The first was Barnes, who is being handled by his son. He looked at the track so continuously during the first two days that he imagined it was jumping up in his face and he began to walk backwards. He was given a rest and told to keep his eyes off the track. Since then, he has been going around all night. On day five, he had reached 420 miles and was in second place. The old war horse keeps plugging along. He marches with the same air of hope and determination that made the Union arms successful against their countrymen. But at times, he forgets the war is over and starts off at the double quick, yelling like he used to yell in the 1860s. Yip! Yip! <laughs> Then he dashes off lap after lap in fast time. Barnes finished in second with 479 miles. Because the crowds were large, Barnes's share of the winnings was $900, or about $27,000 valued in 2019 dollars. After the finish, the crowd cheered the runners. When Gilbert Barnes put on his old army cap and carried a flag over each shoulder, the band struck up marching through Georgia. The crowd went wild with delight. In 1901, Pittsburgh wanted to get into the six-day race too, and the news press were hungry to publish many interesting details of the spectacle. A six-day race was held in Old City Hall on a tiny course of 20 laps to a mile. The race started at 12.28 a.m. with 23 runners. Optimism was strong. Pittsburgh, to all appearances, is about to adopt pedestrianism as its favorite sport. The Old City Hall is the scene of a continuous gathering of people who are cheering the weary six-day walkers on to top speed. The furious pace that the men set when they were sent off on the death-dealing grind has left its traces. Bleary-eyed, foot-sore, and weary, they are defying nature. Every time the band strikes up a lively air, they run like a field of sprinters off on a short dash. Barnes, the old man, is the marvel of the spectators. He is running at an easy gait, and he says he will be away up the standings before the end. He is tall, gaunt, specter-like, with a long wisp of gray hair floating out under his Grand Army helmet like an Indian warrior's scalp lock. The Day 3 report included Sixteen men are speeding themselves into premature old age, if not the grave. The sixteen physical wrecks are all that remain of the big field of well-trained, bright-eyed athletes who started. The others have fallen by the wayside one by one. Of the runners still in contention, all refuse to leave the track for fear that some hated rival may cut down the lead they had gained. It is one of the most killing races on record, and just what the future has in store for the men is a matter of guesswork. Those who followed the sport said that by the 36th hour, typically the runners started acting crazy. 
the cranky spell has been reached, and the contestants are furnishing no end of amusement for the spectators. Their tired brains are in a whirl, and it is only to be expected that the men should act like inmates of a funny house. One runner was so out of it that he became violent and demanded that he be credited with a mile for every time he covered a 120th mile lap. He claimed that the scores and spectators had entered into a conspiracy to defraud him and was so demonstrative that his trainers found it advisable to take him out of the race. After a short sleep, he was put aboard a train and sent to his home. Others started to act strangely. One imagined that everyone who talked to him was his trainer. Now and then he would call for some gentleman in the crowd to come down and give him a rub down. Another asked for a hammer and nails because he said the track ahead of him was springing up. As the news got out that the men were going insane from the terrible strain of the race, people flocked to the place, expecting to see the men do something violent. They all show the terrible effects of the struggle. Spectators pitied them, but the hall is crowded to capacity during the night by the curious, who one minute sympathize with the men in their apparent suffering, and the next minute are moved to laughter by their antics. For hours, perhaps the men will run along without even noticing that they are being watched by interested throngs. Then suddenly, and when least expected, one of them will fly into a fit and rave like a madman. <laughs> Dean of Boston, an African American, suddenly accused his crew of attempting to poison him. Then he would not accept food from them unless it was first tasted by someone to prove it wasn't poisoned. Another runner, Shelton, was given a bottle of ginger ale by his trainer to drink. While he was gulping down the soft stuff, he yelled out that there was a number of men outside throwing stones through the window at him. Suddenly, he threw the bottle through the window, breaking a large pane of glass. The runners struggled along in single file until the band played. Then they would start off at a breakneck pace and astonish the onlookers. When the band played a national tune of some kind, a runner who was born there would demand for the flag of that country and would wave it overhead as he ran like a fury around the track. Yesterday the band played America, and old man Barnes rushed with the stars and stripes while another American runner grabbed a tiny flag and ran behind him. It was a sight to see the two old men sprinting like youths of other days. Kavanaugh demanded an Irish flag and threatened to quit the race unless someone got him one. Race management provided him one. Grabbing it, Kavanaugh rushed about the track, calling upon the band to play his favorite song, The Wearing of the Green. His wish was complied with, and such enthusiasm as followed was never witnessed within the confines of the old city hall. He ran two miles and then placed the flag over his tent. By day five, the event was considered a huge success. No event on the calendar of sport held in Pittsburgh in recent years can be compared with the present affair at Old City Hall. Barnes is delighting his fellow townsmen by his game showing. He is now in second place and likely to stay there, but the old man still has a fighting chance to take the lead from Kavanaugh. All the runners seemed happy knowing that the home stretch was coming. Shelton still imagined that a crowd of enemies was throwing stones through the window at him. Suddenly, he attacked a tin soldier, which was doing pit duty for the advertising department of a big department store. He tore the soldier from the fastenings, and while the race managers tried to separate Shelton from the advertising sign, the crowd laughed. He was taken from the track by his trainers. The press covering the race were amazed at what they had witnessed. It has often been said that man can endure more hardship, cruelty, and physical suffering and still survive than any other living being. The verity has been well exemplified in the six-day grind. The footsore peds are only kept on the track by sheer pluck and gameness, added to force of habit and the use of the most powerful stimulants known to the sporting world. Throughout the last day, the interest in the race grew, and the crowds that came exceeded all previous days of the contest. The 
last few hours, the hall was so crowded that the police had to exert special care to prevent accidents. In the gallery, a band played almost continuously. The music was of the crashing kind and added to the dizzy confusion. Announcements regarding the positions of the men were lost in the deafening uproar. 2,500 people shouted, cheering and waved hats and flags, and the finish arrived. Patrick Cavanaugh won with 506 miles. Barnes finished second and reached 478 miles. It was reported that Dean, the African-American runner, who had reached 412 miles, became insane on the last day and was taken to the hospital. He then escaped his attendants while in the bathroom. A search was at once instituted and kept up for several hours without finding any trace of the missing racer. He was later found wandering the streets and was taken to the police station. His clothing was covered with blood, the result of a hemorrhage from his nose. He was ragged and covered with dirt. He was wholly irrational and babbled incomprehensibly. His trainer soon arrived and took the demented man to St. Francis Hospital. It is said that Dean is completely broken down from his exertions in the race. He will probably recover after rest and treatment. After the finish, Kavanaugh appeared on the track in his racing costume and was greeted with wild applause. A few moments later, Barnes appeared, staggering a little, but declaring he felt in prime condition. For the closing ceremonies, the runners paraded around the track. Next came Barnes, who took up his position, wearing the GAR uniform and carrying a flag. The man played Dixie as he stepped lively and gaily around the track. Barnes waved his flag in high glee. He won 10% of the gross receipts of the event, $350, valued at $10,500 in 2019 dollars. In 1902, a truly unique race was held at Madison Square Garden on a tiny track of 20 laps to a mile. It was a six-day, two-man relay race. Each team member was allowed to run no more than 12 hours on the track each day. There were 42 teams. Barnes teamed up with Sammy Day to form the Grand Army Team. This goes you please race started on February 10, 1902. The elite New York City press was highly critical of the race. After 12 hours, it was commented, There is none who look as if they could truly be described as going as they pleased. Many are already lame and halting. A dirtier, more unkept gang were never before permitted to appear in a public place. Such of the men have not proper clothing, and most of the garments are ill-fitting rags that only half hide the nakedness of the wearers, when a dozen of so are actually clothed in soiled underwear. <gasps> From the group of tents there emanates the unattractive odor of careless cooking and rubbing ointment impartially mixed. Boo, you stink! On the second day, a fight broke out among two of the runners as several thousand looked on. Tom Finnerty was sprinting, taking a position near the rail. Gus Guerrero was following him closely, pressing Finnerty hard and seemed to attempt to shove him from his position. The Irishman turned around and struck Guerrero a stunning blow in the face, felling him. They knocked each other down several times on the course for several minutes. The police jumped in and separated them. The garden was in an uproar as the men were fighting and even the racers halted and joined the crowd that surrounded the contestants. After the police broke it up, they all resumed racing. But when Guerrero passed Finnerty, he struck the Irishman in the face, and another fight started for a few minutes. The police notified everyone that they would stop the race and clear the garden if the trouble wasn't ended. While Barnes was competing, back home in Pennsylvania, Margaret Barnes, his wife, was run down by a large sled near her home. Eight boys in the sled were slightly injured, but Mrs. Barnes was seriously injured and was in a coma. Barnes received the terrible news by telegram telling him that his wife was dying. He quit the race and was given $25 by race management to pay for his expenses home. In the end, the winning team consisting of two of the best ultra runners of the time, Peter Hegelman and Patrick Cavanaugh, reached 770 miles. Thankfully, Margaret Barnes soon recovered, and Barnes quickly made plans to enter another six-day race the next month in Philadelphia. 
During this next race, on the second day, some runners protested the scoring. Stopping before the immense scoreboard, they lost many minutes of precious time in arguing about the distance covered. Several of them claimed that they had been robbed of laps, but in every case, the trouble was straightened out. One runner refused to continue until he was given credit for three laps. After a stormy scene, he consented to continue. Thankfully, we have timing chips in modern times. After three days, many of the runners were getting quite cranky and would often do funny stunts. Barkley appeared on the track wrapped in a blanket and fought his trainers when they tried to take it away from him. Some complained of excessive heat, while others contended that the place was cold. On day four, Max Deal fell on the track and was badly injured by being kicked in the hip by another runner. He was taken to the hospital. The leader, Pat Cavanaugh, fainted and fell on his face on the track. Without any warning, he suddenly reeled and fell forward heavily on his face, throwing the spectators in the greatest excitement possible. He was picked up instantly and carried to his dressing room, where he revived in a few minutes. The doctors checked him out, and soon he was back on the track. On day five, Barnes was struggling. A few days before the race, Barnes had slipped and fallen on his front steps, and the pain in his side started to hurt terribly. The race doctor looked him over and told him that he had a broken rib. He still went on to finish in sixth with 447 miles. In 1903, Barnes ran in the Western Challenge Belt Six Day in the Industrial Art Hall in Philadelphia with 28 runners. The field is entirely too big for the size of the track, and many of the walkers are uncomfortably crowded as they walk around. Tents for the use of the peds take up three sides of the hall, and with the usual vendor stands, reminds one of a circus. On day four, the race was thrown into turmoil. John Click was struggling to hold on to third place. After he was passed by a runner, he began to lose control of himself. A runner, Davis, was next to try to go ahead, and the two became involved in a sprint for a full mile. Finally, Glick was forced to quit the furious pace, and when Davis went by him, Glick struck him in the back of the neck, knocking him down. Davis got up and retaliated, hitting Glick squarely in the face. Others, both runners and trainers, joined in the riot. Several of the spectators leaped over the railing and followed suit, and an all-round roughhouse ensued. The other racers were brought to a standstill, and there was a general stampede on part of the spectators in other parts of the building to the scene of the fight. The police took control, and within a few minutes, the runners were again going around the track. Davis was cheered by the crowds, while jeers and catcalls were hurled at Glick, who sought refuge in his tent. He later apologized to Davis. Barnes finished 7th with 480 miles. 27,000 people paid admission during the six days. In 1905, Pennsylvania passed a law making six-day races illegal, which halted the six-day race comeback in that city. Like New York, races could not be more than 12 hours during a day. In early 1905, people thought Barnes was still well over 70 years old, even though he was only 58. He entered a six-day, 72-hour race, running 12 hours a day, held in the Old City Hall in Pittsburgh. On day five, it was reported, Gilbert Barnes met with an accident last night. All day long, he had been making an awful battle with John Craig for eighth place. When Craig was within a few laps, Barnes fell near his training corner from sheer exhaustion and was picked up unconscious. He was brought to quickly, as not a moment could be spared from the track if he was to hold the coveted position, and he pluckily took to the track at once. In the end, Barnes reached an impressive 325 miles for ninth place. But unfortunately, the race was not a financial success and signaled further that the six-day race would die. The press joked about how boring the six-day races had become for spectators. A six-day race is always enjoyable until the band wakes you up. <laughs> also, one of the six-day racers slept for two days after the race was over. Some of the spectators beat him by four days. <laughs> Barnes retired from multi-day races but made plenty of public appearances carrying an American flag at marathons and other shorter races. 
He was a big celebrity in the Pittsburgh area. In 1918, 71-year-old Barnes started his most famous accomplishment, a walk of about 500 miles from Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania to Camp Lee in Petersburg, Virginia. He made this walk to commemorate his enlistment in the Civil War many decades earlier. He walked most of the way with his 21-year-old grandson. Barnes wore his GAR uniform and cap with his badges of honor pinned on his coat and carried his old army musket. Over his back was strapped a knapsack and from the muzzle of his gun floated an American flag. After eight days, he arrived at Camp Lee where a very large encampment of infantry was being organized. The 71-year-old pedestrian was in good physical condition upon his arrival and said he had enjoyed the long hike immensely. It is estimated that his walk was actually closer to 400 miles, averaging about 50 miles per day, and he climbed more than 12,000 feet along the way. In January 1919, Barnes received the terrible news that he was dying of stomach cancer. A couple months later, he announced publicly that he was, quote, walking his last match in a losing race with no hope of victory. He bid goodbye to his friends, shaking their hands and visiting the courthouse to close up his affairs. On April 30th, 1919, Stephen Gilbert Barnes died at his daughter's home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. His obituary read, He was a leader in sports, particularly as relating to walking and running, winner of scores of medals and honors for outdistancing hundreds of athletes years his junior. Barnes was a familiar figure at all Pittsburgh press meets and marathon races. He loved to walk and to mingle with younger athletes, clad in his Grand Army uniform and carrying over his soldier a United States flag. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>